All right, so it looks like we're live. Uh, welcome everybody back to the channel. Uh, today we're looking at um, the Malign Sorcery uh, book here uh, and the models and the kit in general. And uh, yeah, it's really nice. There's actually, the, the value in this is absolutely, uh, absolutely nuts. So I uh, hope everything is going well. Um, if the levels are good and all of that, it seems to be that everything's going fine. So uh, I'm just gonna start diving right into this. So. Uh, this is uh, the Malign Sorcery uh, box, basically, that we, we got. Uh, and um, we did a preview over at Imaginary Wars, which was pretty solid. And then, um, but it was kind of kind of a farther away, and we were kind of dumping that on top of the box and all that. And so the idea here is to kind of break the models down and the rules down, take a little bit of extra time, and just kind of see um, just kind of see how it ends up uh, ends up looking in the end, anyway. So. Um, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to take a little uh, look here at the Malign Sorcery book. Uh, not spending a ton of time necessarily on the book, but I wanted to cover what an endless spell is uh, because this is what we're going to be uh, essentially playing with for the next little while. Um, and there's a, there's a few kind of bits and bobs in there as well. So um, you can see I've got my cards up here and it's all sorted out uh, so I know where I'm going to be going. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do, if I forget it's page 53, if I forget it's page 53, if I forget it's page uh, 53. Um, but, um, you know, the tons of extra kind of detail, uh, you know, how to use the book, um, the learning of magic, kind of forces of death, things like that. And, um, you know, they, they, they actually add a lot more uh, of the lore and a lot more of the I don't know, just kind of the main feeling of what's going on uh, inside the universe. I think that was the big criticism, of course, is that it was very... Um, it was very uh, laid back and very kind of vague in terms of the history and what kind of happened after this rich old world history. Now, from a company perspective, I get it. They're building a new lore. They're building a new universe. And even with uh, Warhammer Fantasy, it, you know, it didn't build overnight kind of thing. So um, they are breaking down kind of each of these, you know, the, 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 the purple son of Shish. Shyish, uh, and we've got Ravenex gnashing jaws, uh, and just you know, just a nice little bit of detail on each of these, and very much like a codex or an army book, it's kind of covering each of the elements, uh, uh, each of the pieces in here, and giving them just a little bit more depth, so you can visualize uh, essentially what it's doing on the battlefield, which is pretty cool. I've got the prismatic palisade, uh, you know, this big kind of wall of ice, and I love how they show kind of the scale of what it would normally look like. Um, you know, with the, you know, the dragons in here and the armies on here and this great wall of ice, not at all Game of Thrones. Um, uh, the Aether Void Pendulum in here, uh, you know, this massive lava thing going in. And again, they give you a sense of scale of this thing crashing through the battlefield. So um, all of these, uh, all the models themselves are essentially just templates to represent kind of the, the fact of what's going on on there. So uh, pretty sweet. Uh, the Suffocating Grave Tide. Uh, again, it's just this big, massive thing rolling over armies and these skulls and this, you know, this earth kind of just consuming people wholesale, um, kind of composty gone wrong. Uh, the um, umbral sp uh, spell portal, uh, so the ability to kind of connect. Now you can see that the scale on this one is a little more true uh, with the storm cast or the uh, wizard there casting those those portals. But again, just a nice kind of flavorful thing that will inform how you paint it and, and how you uh, treat this thing on the on the table. So, yeah, pretty sweet. Pretty sweet indeed. Um, we've got the Malevolent Maelstrom, which is a bunch of, you know, these kind of uh, bluish kind of skeletons, uh, you know, kind of rolling around these spirits of these trapped undead, uh, you know, getting kind of broiled around. The model? Yeah, the model is okay. We're going to try and salvage a bit with painting. It's probably my least favorite model of the, the set, but again, we'll get into that. Uh, we got the Quicksilver Swords, so just basically these massive amounts of swords being fueled by this kind of spectral energy hammering down into your opponents, which is, which is pretty sweet indeed. Uh, the burning head, this big massive skeleton head, uh, very reminiscent of the flying skull heads in Doom. Uh, I used to love those things because they, you know, they chase you around the map and they'd come out of nowhere from around corners and all that. So I expect this thing to be very much a this kind of roving, you know, flaming head. And actually, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to painting that one up as well. Uh, the Geminids of Ulgish, 
Um, it's a combination of these, you know, kind of yin and yang. That's the the idea of it. But it's actually these two different realms, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, sharing energies back and forth, pulling people into these 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 massive, uh, you know, black holes of death and destruction and spiritual hell. Kind of cool. Um, then they break it down a little bit. They talk about some of the, the other ones that are in here. Uh, the chronomatic cogs, uh, which are uh, up here, just kind of these, uh, you know, these, these mechanical marching bits of time in here. Uh, we've got the, uh, the soul snare shackles. Uh, so these things kind of coming up and imagining to, to restrict uh, in there. And we've got the emerald life swarm, which is also pretty sweet with these, um, you know, the little buggies coming out from, uh, you know, coming out from the, uh, from the, the souls of the dead or, you know, basically this life energy tearing around. Now, what's cool about this is that they've, um, they got, you know, kind of all the artwork and all these different pieces in there. And this is very much an orky kind of spell, the gnashing uh, jaws, the gnashing uh, uh, jaws here. But it's not, um, it's not restricted just to the orcs. We, we're going to see that as we, uh, as we go along. But they've got kind of, you know, with the, the painting uh, elements in here. I love the luminosity of this. We're going to see if we can pull off something like that in there. Um, and then this guy, the, the Maelstrom. Yeah, it's... Uh... Could have been better. Could have been way better. Um, they also cover the other model that's not included in the box, uh, the Bailwind Vortex. And they actually offer up a card for that as well, which is, uh, again, a pretty sweet deal, all things being equal. Uh, I'm really digging the fact that, uh, you know, that, that they actually kind of support the older models in there. That's the, that's the huge advantage of playing with G-Dub stuff. It's kind of luminescent uh, prismatic palisade and quicksilver uh, swords and the emerald life, uh, uh, the life swarm here looking uh, looking pretty neat and kind of vibrant and all of that. So we go trucking along, we get to look at all the different ones that are in here. Uh, they talk about, you know, kind of a cool painting guide. Uh, we'll follow these for some and, um, you know, some of them, they don't look that great. Like the, the dry brushing is a little rough, but um, let's see what we can come up with for that. And then we get into kind of the rules, uh, the main the main chunk of the rules that are in here. So we've got the malign uh, sorcery. They talk about uh, kind of what goes on in there. But the main thing I wanted to focus on here was the endless spells section of, of the book. So um, this is a little different than the other spells we've had in the sense that um, we've, uh, you know, kind of cast... Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, things that shield your guys, uh, things that embolden your guys, you know, direct damage spells, things like that, where the endless spells are interesting in the sense that they, they just kind of kick around. So that's kind of the big sex appeal of, of what's going on with the, the models here. So um, first bit of note, uh, if you have an endless spell model and it's War Scroll, all wizards uh, in your army know the spell in addition to any other spells they know. Rules for all the endless spell uh, are included in this product, so they've got the cards for them. Uh, Bellwind Vortex can be found in a separate accompanying War Scroll cards. So they give you the card for the Bellwind Vortex, which is really nice, but everybody knows these spells, so you're not stuck to just uh, orcs or stuck to just uh, um, or sorry, or rooks, or you're stuck to you know uh, you know your your dispossessed guys who don't like magic, uh, or your stormcast or whatever. They, you can actually use them for pretty much anything you want in there. So uh, the endless spell models are not set up on the battlefield. Uh, obviously, they have to be kind of summoned, but they're just being clear about that in the rules. Um, uh, where and how the endless spell model is set up will be described on its war scroll. So they've got, you know, they're kind of just pushing it off to the cards. That gives them a lot of expansion for other endless spells. Uh, and you can see that right, right away with the soul blight stuff. They've got uh, some of the spells there as well. Unless otherwise, uh, unless noted otherwise, an endless spell model cannot be attacked or affected by spells or abilities. This is actually pretty interesting. So you're basically putting these things on the table, and they are, um, well, they're ostensibly just kind of kicking around, um, and you cannot really just go attack them and brute force them out. You've got to go and disband them. So if you don't have a dispelling uh, model, that might be a, a little on the, the tricky side. An endless spell cannot be moved unless it is a predatory uh, endless spell. See op opposite. So um, basically the wall spells are walls, all of that. But the predatory ones, they kind of go and hunt around, which is, which is pretty cool. 
Uh, in order to attempt to cast an endless spell, you must have a model for the spell available that is not already on the battlefield. So you can cast multiples, but you need multiple kits. If you have two Balewind Vortex models in your collection and both are on the battlefield, you cannot attempt to cast another uh, Balewind uh, Vortex, which is pretty sweet. Now, if that model comes off, I'm assuming you can just put it back on because you'll have the model at that point. Uh, Wizard cannot attempt to cast more than one endless spell in the same turn, even if they are different endless spells. So they're trying to limit the impact on the table because, I mean, I think you could um, definitely spam these out the door, uh, but it'd be pretty neat to see uh, once we start getting into once we start getting into games. Now the predatory endless spells. Um, it says many spells are mo immobile uh, and once cast remain in the same location. However, some can move across the battlefield in search of living prey. So these ones have a behavior all unto themselves, where they'll end up going after uh, you know enemy models, which is which is pretty sweet indeed. Uh, the players alternate up, um, picking a predatory endless spell to move, uh, starting with the player who has the second turn. So what's interesting is is that you've got um, these spells out there, but they're not necessarily just another part of your army. Uh, they basically go cranking out the door, and um, uh, you know if any. But uh, the predatory endless spells that have not yet been moved can be chosen. Once all predatory endless spells have been moved. The start of the first turn of the battle round, so these can, in fact, you know, turn around and eat your own dudes, which I think is, which is pretty awesome. Uh, reminds me of that uh, scene out of the Hunt for Red October, where he says, you know, you fool, you've killed us all. So, uh, pretty solid. Um, it's all in the War Scroll. Unlike other models, Predatory Endless Spell it can cross the edge of the battlefield uh, when it's moved. However, if, if it does so, the spell is immediately dispelled. So. Um, so you can just move it off the table if it's uh, if you have the option you want it out of your face, which is which is neat. So they'll be roving around kind of the center of the table, uh, and then finally to remove the endless spells, there's only a couple ways you can do it. A wizard dispels the endless spells as described below. Uh, the endless spell crosses the edge of the battlefield when it's moved. Um, so if it hits, it goes off. It's it's uh, un, uh, unsummoned, I guess. And a, a method described on the model's war scroll is used to remove the spell from play. So again, they're leaving this all open so that you can have multiple uh, endless spells, uh, you know, kind of in the future. And again, we saw that with the soul blight, which is which is pretty cool. So that's one of the things I wanted to cover, or two of the things I wanted to cover, kind of, um, you know, what an endless spell is, and, you know, kind of how it moves, and of course how to remove it as well, which is which is pretty sweet, and you'll see that on the War Scrolls. So, finishing off the book here, you'll see that they've got, uh, you know, even more um, battle plans, which is great. And for crying out loud, I still don't get how people would just play the same battle plans out of the book all the time when you've got all these different options available. I mean, um, unless you're playing, you know, five games a week, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult. Even if you're playing five games a week, it'll be very difficult to kind of grind through all of the different battle plans. Now, what's really neat um, is they talk about kind of the different uh, the different areas. Uh, uh, the different realms and how they affect the spells themselves, which is, which is pretty sweet actually. And you can get uh, the command traits. Now I checked War Scroll Builder this morning, and they actually have the location of your army, so you get these different uh, spells and abilities in there as well. So it's already out in the War Scroll Builder on how your army can be affected by the different uh, different realms. So uh, they got the Path to Glory rules, which is fantastic. More and more uh, battle plans. And then, um, you know, they got spells of Shish, Shaman, uh, Ulgu, all of these other things. So it's just so cool to see now that now not only do these, um, not only do these new templates to represent all these spells and these, these, these endless spells are out there now, it's also really cool to see that we have, based on the location, things that you can just pull uh, that are a little bit different. And um, I mentioned it in the larger review, but wouldn't it be cool in some of the narrative pieces out there to go and look for the Stonehorn Blade or look for the Gargant Bone Dice or any of these other pieces and just go out there and actively find these things? Um, what great mission objectives, if, if anything, just for a little bit of extra narrative. And um, even though they can be used against you, they do cost points. But again, I don't think it would be uh, right to just keep spamming these things out the door all the time. But even then, the points are so low. Like the Quicksilver Swords, uh, an endless spell that does damage is 20 points. So, you know, uh, the ability to go out there and just kind of start projecting damage or putting some of these predatory spells out there, pretty darn solid, really neat. And of course, more battle plans. So 
really cool to uh, to see that. So uh, the Malign Sorcery book, I am really really digging uh, in its uh, you know just kind of in its current form. Uh, lots of fluff, lots of uh, you know a little bit extra rules, but loads of battle plans, loads of different ways to play your game and have that variety. So really really cool. All right, so I'll uh, get rid of this. Dropping stuff as I go. And um, what I want to do is kind of take a look at some of the cards now. Um, though, And we'll look at the models at the same time. So uh, we've got the Bailwind Vortex here. And it's actually you know really neat to see that they've got a card for this. Um, these are not the kind of shrunk down PDFs that they had uh, for the, uh, the, the Coronate. Uh, you know, kind of the Cornkin, Demonkin, lots well, of the 40k version, but the, the Cornate uh, cards, they were all kind of shrunk down. It was the same with the Stormcast, and I think it was the same with the Fire Slayers as well, if they, if they even have cards. But, um, uh, but what I'm really digging here is the fact that this is a nice, usable-sized card, which is fantastic. And we saw that in some of the special characters in the new box, they just may give you a bigger card, which is pretty cool. So the Bailwind Vortex rules are here, which is nice. And then um, uh, we've got all the other cards as well. And uh, having them all nice and tidy and not having to buy them separately is pretty darn, pretty darn sweet. So a huge amount of value in that, uh, in that initial box. Um, now, before we start playing with the models and looking at the rules and stuff as well, I just wanted to go over real quick kind of the assembly instructions for, um, you know, kind of what came in the box. Now, this is just a, a super quick one. Uh, it's its own separate booklet, which is nice. We're not going to be interfering with any of the other work that we're, that we're doing. Um, but uh, again, it's that great kind of current mode for GW of having uh, all the different things color coded, which is awesome. Uh, the plastics, of course, are color coded. Now, putting the uh, sun together, uh, you can see it literally takes up, uh, literally, we'll get to the staples here in a second, but it literally takes up just a little over, or it takes just up a little over one page over halfway through the entire booklet. Um, it's a fairly complex uh, build. And um, on that side note, one of the things that I'd like to kind of draw attention to is this. So when you're putting it together, uh, and you'll see it when I, you'll kind of recognize it when we do it. When you're putting it together, you've got these pegs that go in here, the, the number four on the models. But what I also want to call attention to is you'll see there's an A here and an A here. There's a B here and a B here. And on the actual uh, you know, pieces themselves, they actually have an A and an A engraved in the, in the piece here as well. And when you pull those together, uh, they'll fit. And it's very important because these pieces are at just a little tiny bit of an angle. And you can see the angle here. And of course, that is hyper important for when we're putting the, uh, the big ball of death together for sure. So I uh, just wanted to make note of that. I'll mention it again. And uh, yeah, very important to, to do that. When you're assembling the models as well, make sure you get in there and you use clippers instead of uh, you know just hammering away with uh, with a blade, um, and then use your blade to kind of trim the extra little bit of flash. It's going to be very important when you're putting this uh, when you're putting this guy together because uh, the pieces have to fit just just so. Um, the um, again the instructions are fairly nice and clear, and they kind of walk you through different steps. This is where you stop to go pee or uh, go get a tea or a water or a coffee or something like that, uh, and they say, "Okay, you're good at to that point," and then they kind of keep walking you through. I found it uh, pretty pretty easy to follow, and you know they really break down this uh, you know the purple sun because they really want you to put it together uh, correctly. So follow the instructions on that one for sure. Um, very easy to follow. They show you which base. Oh, the other thing, the bases were labeled as well uh, that came in this. So instead of saying, you know, it's a, it's a certain uh, width by a certain height, uh, or, you know, a width and depth of the base or whatever, they actually tell you which base to pull. So in this case, it's base E4. And um, yeah, definitely high value uh, in terms of putting this thing together. Uh, we've got the uh, Emerald Life Swarm here, which is our, you know, little big bugs of doom, which is fantastic. We've got uh, the, the Geminids of Wilgish, uh, and those guys, you know, fairly easy to put together in two parts. Uh, the Prismatic Palisade, again, this big ball of, uh, big wall of ice or crystal or what have you. Uh, again, very easy to put together. It's two pieces, which is fantastic. Uh, the base is kind of integrated in, which is cool. Um, 
the burning head, simple two parts, uh, malevolent maelstrom, two parts, uh, chronomatic cogs, again, two parts. Uh, so I found these really easy to put together, which is great. Um, some of them were even one part. Um, so you'll see that the Quicksilver Swords and the Aether Void Pendulum, they're just one part attached to a base. Uh, base is labeled again, awesome. Uh, the Umbral Spell Portal, uh, again, one piece each, uh, very easy to put together. And I mean, the most complex at this point is the Soul Snare Shackles. And, uh, you know, it's just the two different pieces to hear. Uh, side note, when I put the models together, let me grab one here. Um, I wanted to make sure that I lined up uh, kind of in a, in, a, in a straight line here with these two side pieces. It, it splits perfectly through there. When I first put one down, and you can see that this is the one I messed up just a tiny little bit on. Uh, but when I put the first one down, there's I didn't have them straight. I had them just kind of uh, at about maybe a 15 degree kind of list. And uh, the bottoms didn't match up. And I didn't know they were supposed to match up until I put it together. Uh, and then I looked at it and said, oh, no. So I pulled the glue off right away and fixed it. Uh, but just make sure you're kind of doing it at this... Uh, this kind of, uh, you know, just perpendicular to that line across, right, like that. So uh, then you won't have any problems putting that together. Uh, and if I look at the instructions, it's, well, it's kind of clear, uh, but not entirely. Anyway, um, the suffocating grave tide was another one that went together uh, pretty well. Now make sure that you take your time with this one. Trim everything really well because the base is actually made up of the two separate pieces. So make sure you trim everything nicely uh, and then uh, do a lot of dry fitting before you kind of glue it in. As a matter of fact, when I built it, I just used uh, my plastic weld. So I assembled it, dry fit it together and just gooped a bunch of plastic weld on these little joints at the, the bottom. And I'll show you. So there's these little joints uh, here and here that kind of hold them together. And there's a bunch, if I look inside, yeah, there's a bunch on the inside uh, as well. So I glued it all together uh, once I had the joints and I just grabbed my plastic weld and just blobbed in a pile of the plastic weld in there to, to just make sure it sticks together. But it uh, forms a nice hold and everything fits together super nice, which is great. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, next up, the Ravenex Gnashing Jaws. So uh, up after the sun, it's kind of the most complex uh, one that's out there. Now, when I built it, and when I do the preview here, I haven't actually glued this together. Now, um, I know they're all snap fits. I totally get that. But with this one here, um, I just want to make sure that I have uh, the ability to get in and wash on the inside. A lot of what I'm going to be doing with this is just this nice kind of washing inside over maybe like a bone color. Um, I do want it to look a little orky still, a little... Uh, a little kind of a rookie, I guess. So I want to, you know, kind of be able to get in there with some greens and stuff, and really uh, pull that, uh, pull that in there. And I think also priming is going to be fairly difficult, um, you know, getting in from all the different angles in behind. So um, I just kind of uh, use the. Um, just kind of that that pressure fit together uh, and I'm just going to use that for now I'll take it apart I'll prime it I'll paint it and then I'll glue it back together so uh, that's going to be my strategy for uh, for that one for sure and then at the end it shows you all the finished products of all the new toys that you've got and uh, holy cow are there a load of plastics uh, in here oh side note uh, the other one I didn't glue was the life swarm uh, up here and I didn't glue that because I want to be able to paint underneath it as well. And then I'll mount it to the base. So i um, still debating how I'm going to do that one. But, um, you know, the pictures in the book, they've got, you know, this kind of like greenish, just washed kind of nilic oxide kind of look. So maybe I'll put the basing on there as well. But for this guy, uh, the gnashing jaws, I'm going to paint it in parts. But you'll see that in the painting video when we, uh, when we cover that. So that's the instructions. Now, again, typical G-Dub instructions uh, showing you kind of uh, you know how things go together. They don't give you the glue spots that they had uh, before. And I think that's primarily because they're just in selling this essentially as a kind of a snap fit kit as opposed to a gluing, uh, a gluing kit. They're telling you to snap it, not glue it. But uh, my OCD, I'm gluing it. Oh, and the uh, chronomatic cogs. I didn't glue these together as well because I really want to get in the detail and I'll just glue them after. So there we are. All right, so next up, um, let's look at, do, 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 do. Um, loving it. Uh, let's start breaking down the models themselves and uh, we'll look at the cards and the rules that go along with them. So um, first thing you'll notice is Holy crap! Are there a lot of? Uh, is there a lot of plastic in this uh, in this kit? So let me just move the other camera down over here now that I got some room. Should be good. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's start taking a look at the models uh, themselves. 
So what are we going to start with? Uh, let's start with the big ugly sun because, uh, oh man, what a cool model. And the big ugly sun is, uh, is, is big. Now I've still got the overhead cam. If I do the, uh, the lower cam, it just kind of floods the whole camera. Like it's just such a massive, massive model. It's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's loads going on with it, which is cool. And, um, it wasn't a ton of work to put together, but I found that uh, I was a little timid in trusting what was going on. So you can see that there are a few seams in here, uh, and it's not the same kind of uh, you know, high profile plastic that we have with our, our miniatures, uh, that kind of high density plastic. But there are a few seams, and I think that's going to be inevitable, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's not really that bad. Uh, I took some plastic weld and I kind of gobbed over in here a little bit and then just kind of held them together. And that seemed to tidy up a good chunk of the, the seams. Now I could go in with plastic, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, with, with liquid green stuff. I could go in here and just kind of tidy that up, but I, I don't know. I think it'll be fine. It's and we're, we are talking about a template um, and I don't know if we're gonna win any best painted awards for our uh, or our big purple sun, uh, or if you want, um, you know, maybe we will fill it with green stuff and kind of see what's going on. Um, we'll we'll kind of see what the feedback is in the in the comments for that. But uh, in general, the kit goes together really nice. I had someone, uh, or I saw someone posting posting online that you need it's a necessity. Like there's these big massive gaps and stuff. And I do honestly believe that if you've trimmed your models well, um, you know, take a little bit of extra time and you'll get in there and it'll be, uh, it'll be fine. So forget the construction side of things. Let's look at the model itself. So if I grab uh, one of my Cursed Legion uh, Orky guys here, I just want to show you the scale of this thing. Like it's just absolutely freaking nuts. Like it's, it's huge. It's uh, it's bigger than some of those new smaller uh, Titans that are out there. Uh, you know, the kind of the combat robots and stuff. And uh, like like it's just it's just like especially from above, it just kind of dwarfs uh, the size. If I switch over to the other camera, maybe you'll get a better sense of scale. Yeah, like <laughs> it's just huge, right? Um, and I think it's really cool. I mean, having this big you know, you know, monster purple sudden roving across the table. I think that's just a, I think that's just a massive thing uh, to have around. It'll be fun. Like, I mean, and you can always call it the big purple sun. Uh, side note, I was walking around the house as I was kind of holding, kind of compressing together, um, you know, some of the gaps and stuff. And uh, the ball, uh, the uh, the ball nature of this thing, uh, the dog was quite interested in this thing. So <laughs> make sure if you got a dog, you don't want them uh, walking away with your new uh, your new toy for sure. So the scale again is quite uh, quite large, and um, uh, you know it's got lots of spikes to it. It, do it doesn't feel fragile though. Like I mean, these are on here uh, pretty well, and they're they're quite. Um, they're quite thick in terms of kind of at the base and they're, they're very strong, which is nice. Uh, subtle note, they've got the mounting point to the base and they've actually got four points where the spikes come down and form essentially the, uh, the connection with the base, the larger base. So uh, you plastic weld those guys in and then you, uh, you know, plastic weld that to the base and you've got to really, like this thing doesn't wobble or, or move around at all. Now, first impressions of the model itself, um, you know, a big skull uh, blowfish uh, coming at your enemies, a big spectral skull blowfish, kind of damn cool, actually. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of its own amazing ludicrousness, and I love uh, it. So um, lots of detail in there. Uh, going to be really nice to paint as well. Uh, we're going to go full on purple with this, with washes, and kind of going from a darker to lighter kind of gradient. And then we'll, you know, kind of amplify that on the spikes coming out. So I think it'll have loads of character in the game, and um, yeah, just just big purple ball of awesome uh, anger and, and, and rage kind of rolling across the field. It should be uh, should be pretty solid. So um, awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, really liking the model. Uh, again, a little bit of a pain to put together. And uh, to be honest, it's well not a pain, just just time consuming more than anything else. So. Uh, all right, so um, let's uh, kind of continue on here. Uh, we'll we'll take a look at the maybe the rules for this guy. So I'll set him aside, and then we'll look at the uh, the purple sun rules itself. Um, so it's a single model. Uh, to summon it, you've got to do your casting value of eight, which is cool, uh, and you have to do it wholly within six inches of the caster. Now, 
this could be dangerous, right? In the sense that this, you, know, you unleash this thing at six inches within range of the caster, that's fine. But don't forget, your opponent gets to move him around on his turn as well. So uh, this guy's predatory. Uh, it's a predatory endless spell. It can move up to nine inches and can fly. Uh, so nothing's going to stop this uh, big purple sun from coming through, which is cool. Uh, it's got Swirling Death. Uh, when the model's set up, the player who set it up can immediately make a move with it. So you can get it your nine inches away. So that gets you within uh, 15 inches away from the caster, which is good. Um, uh, end given form. After the model is moved, each unit that has any models it uh, passed across and... Uh, and each other unit that is within one inches at the end of the move is subjected to the Purple Sun's Baleful Energies. For each unit subjected to the Baleful Energies, roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit. For each six, one model in that unit is slain. So this is basically, it just plows through stuff, and if anything ends within an inch of it, um, you roll a bunch of dice. So again, great for taking out horde armies, which is pretty cool. Uh, subject one from the bravery characteristic of all units while they're within six inches of this model. So not only are you, you know, you're kind of just uh, curb stomping these guys as they go by, um, at the end, all that battle shock is going to go in and you're going to add one to that as well, which is cool. Uh, if your battle is taking place in the realm of death, this model can move 12 inches instead of nine. So really cool to see the sun out there, but as you have, you know, if you take place in the realm of death, this sucker's on fire. It's awesome. So cool to see. Nice. So, um, yeah, digging the model, rules are kind of cool and fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how, uh, kind of ultimately how that all plays out. Now, next up, I've got the uh, Quicksilver Swords. Um, so I'll grab them out of the, the pile here. Now, the Quicksilver Swords, uh, you know, are a little bit more of a decent uh, scale for this. Again, bringing our, our Rook first company dude out here um, so uh, a little bit smaller can kind of fit into uh, different spaces and all of that um, liking the model itself in terms of assembly definitely very easy um, and uh, it was doing the one piece that was in there and it's also nice to see that um, you know we've got kind of this cool combination you can have these swords and either make them kind of rusty or perfectly pristine and have these like swirling energies just propelling these swords uh forward which is which is pretty solid i might go with um kind of the, the gold you know the stereotypical gold hilt and then the, the the bright swords itself and have all these swirling energies coming around it uh, just for the sake of uh, you know, just having a little bit of extra contrast, which is which is nice. Uh, also, one of the things I want to do as I go through is I'm going to have a little bit of a different color, um, uh, you know, of spells, kind of um, a different color of these, you know, energies, um, you know, propelling the different spells forward. So uh, this one in the book, they've kind of gone with a yellow. Maybe I'll I'll go with that. We'll we'll have to see. Anyway, um, pretty sweet to see. Really liking the, the the kind of the general flavor and feel of it. And uh, of course, they're pointing down, so you can get all dramatic when these things go on the on the rampage against someone else. Uh, you know, not at all imposing. <laughs> so it looks good. All right, so let's uh, let's take a look at the rules. So for the Quicksilver Swords, um, we've got the ability to summon it. Uh, it's got a casting value of 6, which is great. Uh, it's predatory as well. Uh, it can move up to 8 inches and fly. So that's... Uh, that's substantial. Again, the flying is kind of the big one. Uh, when the model is set up, the player who set it up can immediately make a move with it. Great. Um, dancing Blades. After this model is moved, you can pick one unit within six inches of it and roll 12 dice. For each roll of a six, that unit suffers one mortal wound. Uh, if the unit being rolled for is a chaos unit, it suffers one mortal wound each roll of a five plus instead. So again, very... Um, very kind of one-sided leaning if you're going up against a chaos model. Um, so these are noble and valiant swords, question mark, I guess. Um, but holy cow, 12 dice, that's a, that's a massive attack kind of coming out the door. And if I remember, it was pretty cheap to get this guy on the, the table. Now, it is predatory and it is endless. And so the opponents can take turns uh, moving it around, which is interesting. Empowered by Shimon, uh, if your battle is taking place in the realm of metal, you can roll 15 dice for the model's dancing blade ability instead of 12. <laughs> That's huge. So um, if you're getting the, you know, it's worth the price of admission just for the swords alone, I think. Um, really cool, uh, really cool idea. And you know, it is a bunch of swords. And I wonder if there's 12 in there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Oh, is there, did I miscount? Let's see. 1, 2... 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, 2, 4, 6, 8, 
10 swords. Oh man, wouldn't that be awesome if uh, if they had 12 swords and that would be the 12 swords flying out. But uh, I guess uh, art versus life, I suppose. Um, anyway, really liking the, the idea of it anyway. Uh, it's a nice, easy to get on the table, paint up, and just a cool kind of addition to your army. Having these, uh, you know, these flying swords is a bit like a predator drone, and it can reach out and, uh, and strike out six inches. So massive amounts of damage. Um, I pick one unit, so it's not all units within six. So that's, that's, that's fine. All right. So um, a little bright on this one here. So um, I'll just uh, do a quick shot there just so you can kind of see what the rules are for the, the card itself. Now, um, moving on, let's uh, take a look now at the, uh, at the Aether Void Pendulum. And it's kind of funny. This is one of my, oh man, this is kind of one of my favorite uh, models in, in the piece. And it's probably going to be the first one that I'll, I'll paint up. And uh, I'm not really sure why I'm so kind of stoked on this guy, but... I think the idea of this big, massive kind of penduluming axe, uh, you know, kind of moving around and uh, kind of flying about, uh, you know, swinging back and forth, just sweeping up stuff. Maybe kind of that vision of uh, Sauron at the beginning of Lord of the Rings. Um, but uh, it's it's actually nice. It's one piece. It's a big model, which is cool. And this big, massive axe flying through the air with all, you know, trailing all these crazy energies behind it. I just like the idea of that visual. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty darn sweet. Uh, loads of detail in the model here itself. You can see that you've got all these little runes that are, you know, super easy to paint. Uh, and once you've washed it, it'll have lots and lots of kind of visual, visual appeal. Uh, you know, kind of the energies are not taking over the whole thing. It's just trailing it behind. Loads of animation as it just kind of swings back and forth. Um, so I picture this big, massive spectral axe, and going back to the picture, is huge. Uh, how, how terrifying would that be as this thing is flying through the air? So uh, yeah, really, really sweet. And it's um, despite all the little kind of fiddly hang-off bits, it's actually pretty sturdy. Uh, that's the other advantage of this plastic. It's not as, you know, you don't get as crazy fine detailed as the, uh, the gray plastics. But I mean, this is a nice, hard plastic so i don't really fear too much about these these little bits and pieces if you break it man you're really working to to break it for sure all right so let's look at the uh the card itself here um so the aether void pendulum uh is uh to summon it here it's a casting value uh, so it's a fully within six inches casting value six so fairly easy to pull off i guess uh, it is also predatory, so it will be moving uh, 8 inches and can fly, which is also kind of neat. So I guess it just goes through things more than, than over things. Uh, slicing into reality, when this model is set up, the player set it up can immediately make a move with it. That seems to be pretty standard so far. Uh, incidentally, I haven't taken a real solid look at the cards yet. Go figure. Uh, after this model is moved, each unit that has any models it passed across and each other unit within 1 inch, very much like the sun, um, uh, suffers D6 mortal wounds so you're not really even um you're not even really dicing this one out it just goes so one is about hordes uh one is about a fixed number of wounds and this one here is about a fixed number of mortal wounds as well so make sure you've got your uh dispellers out there definitely uh, st uh making this thing work Whenever you set up the Aether, Vin pendulum, uh, Aether Void Pendulum, you must place uh, place it lengthways in the direction you wish it to move. Whether uh, Whenever it moves, move it in a straight line in that direction. Oh, so this doesn't have a lot of free movement. Um, and uh, kind of interesting. So if it's your turn, you can move one of your spells and then you give this one to your opponent. And the, all they can do is move it in a straight line. But no... <laughs> Knowing that this thing is going to be flying across the table, and if it catches anybody, you're looking at D6 moral wounds. Now, if you're Skaven, who cares? Take the wounds, get right through that space. If you are, uh, you know, Stormcast, uh, you guys are pretty pricey, or trolls, or, um, uh, or, or, or ogres, or anything like that. Um, this is going to cost you, so you've got to make sure you kind of stick away from this. And I don't see it as so much as a damage-dealing uh, you know, kind of endless spell. I see it more as a, um, as kind of an emotional weapon against your opponent where you, he knows it's going to be there. So you can actually deny a good chunk of the board. Um, imagine if someone is sitting there and like literally camping out and just, uh, you know, just hiding in the back and kind of put, putting up a bit of a gun line. Um, send that Aether Void Pendulum across and, uh, oh man, he knows it's coming so we'll have to move. 
Sweet. So, uh, again, uh, the model, yeah, lots of flavor and detail to this guy here. And um, again, love those runes. I think it's going to be pretty sweet to see those uh, see those all painted up. And I'll probably this is probably the first one that I'll do, um, primarily because I've got the washes for the uh, the effects that I want to do, and um, you know the kind of the gold and kind of the burnished silver is going to be very easy to pull off uh, pull off in this sense here. Really cool model, liking it. All right, next up, let's look at the uh, suffocating grave tide. So I've got the card here, uh, the Suffocating Grave Tide, uh, the model itself. Uh, let's take a peek. Now, this model is, um, it's an interesting one for sure. Uh, if I look at this here, it's kind of this big tidal wave. Uh, and it's about the height of a regular, uh, a regular dude, which is, which is kind of cool. And um, lots of kind of cool ways to maybe paint this. Uh, it's not going to be incredibly uh, pretty because it's going to be mostly dirt and kind of bone effects. But I do like the idea of these um, of these almost, I can picture them kind of traveling like dolphins uh, in and out of the water as this, as you know, they're kind of moving over and grabbing people and dragging them down to the depths. I mean, really, really cool. Uh, on the back, they've got details of kind of broken architecture in there. Totally not an Inquisition symbol sitting right there. Um, I see what's going on. You know, they got all the gold plates and all this, and, you know, the Sigmar iconography on there. And, you know, the rest is basically just this big lump of dirt. So not crazy inspiring in that case, but really liking the just the way it's kind of set up and in the way this is kind of delivered there. So not bad. Um, you know, the, the, the tidal wave of dolphin skulls, uh, sure, looks awesome. I'm totally into that as well. Um, we can see that in there. We can see all the rocks getting kind of dragged up. And it's got that nice kind of tsunami effect. Uh, having the base included as well is nice because then you're not really placing things in a wrong way. And if you trim your stuff nicely, it should be, it should be just fine. So, um, digging that model, uh, it's kind of not the most uh, amazing one. Um, you know, kind of park it on, a, you know, 6, 7 out of 10, uh, uh, if that. But we'll see what it looks like when it's painted up. And uh, we'll see what kind of effects we can come in to, to make that a thing. Um, for the rules itself, we've got the, uh, we've got the rules here. So the Suffocating Grave Tide, um, it is a casting value of 6. And you pull it within 4 inches of the caster. So this tidal wave is literally coming out. Uh, it's predatory, so it moves 8 inches and can fly. Fair enough. Uh, necrotic Tide. When this model is set up, the player set up can immediately uh, make a move with it. So uh, they're coming up with different words for this. You know, when you set it up, you can move it. And then, well, see, you know, when you think about it, what a great way to kind of pull stuff away from the caster because you set it up and move on it, uh, move it out. And at the same time, I mean, they can really, you know, do some serious damage to the units in, in front of them that are kind of threatening them. So just kind of coming to mind as we, uh, as we truck along. Uh, after this model is moved, each unit that has any models it passed across suffers D3 mortal wounds. So a bit like the um, a bit like the uh, the pendulum there. In addition, subtract one from the bravery characteristic of each unit that has any models it passed across until the end of the ba battle round. So they get, it's a little scary. It's a little little terrifying. Um, when a missile weapon targets a unit that has all of its models within one inches of this model, the target unit receives the benefit of cover. Ah, so it's moving cover. Um, but uh, as it moved past across, suffers D3 mortal and subtract one from the brave character. Each unit has models it passed across. Oh, okay, coming together now. Um, so it, there's no radius of fear, okay, and there's no radius of damage. So it's trucking along at eight inches, but when a missile weapon, so you've actually got this mobile cover uh, if you kind of hide behind it. How cool is that? Pretty cool. Uh, if your battle is taking place in the realm of death, this model can move up to 12 inches instead of 8. Wow, so you've got this mobile cover wall, this bulldozer in front of your units um, doing D3 mortal wounds and subtracting one bravery. So not the most amazing killy thing, but there is benefits on top of that. Not only is it going to prevent people from charging you because it's a model, it's going to keep people from shooting at you a little bit, and... Um, it's going to do damage for you as it goes up the front. Kind of a neat idea. And it's nice to see that they're not just copying and pasting all the different uh, pieces in there. So nice, nice. Actually, that's that's really cool. Really, really cool. Okay, next up, the Burning Head. So I'll grab our uh, card here. 
switch over our camera and I'll grab our burning head. Great large head. All right, so the burning head itself is a very simple model to put together. Uh, you can see some obvious seam lines in here, uh, but it's, you know, it's not too bad. It's just like any other model. It's just a little on the nose, I guess, uh, seam wise. Um, and uh, the giant flying skull. I mean, this is the flaming flying skull. This is kind of uh, an awesome, awesome kind of look and feel. It's got this... Uh, Oh, I don't know, almost kind of a seahorse shape going on with it here. Uh, the big head out front and all these flames kind of kicking off the back. Uh, definitely don't leave this guy as a blue model because it just doesn't seem like that's the, the right way to go. Although, if you did it with kind of a, a white and blue, instead of having it be all fire, you could have this kind of ethereal fire of white and blue. That would also be kind of cool, actually. Um, the model itself, again, very simple to put together, but uh, I really liked uh, just, just kind of the motion to it. It's, it looks like this guy is booking along, uh, screaming along, uh, grabbing, uh, biting dudes as he goes, uh, big lava skull. Yeah, awesome. Really, really cool. Um, but again, very simple to put together and just kind of a neat model to, to have on the, on the table, I think. Especially if we can get that luminosity going with the flames, that'll be pretty, uh, that'll be pretty darn sweet. So, okay, perfect. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the rules themselves. So the burning head here, we've got uh, the summoning is a casting value of seven. You set it up within three inches of the character uh, and then you can move it right away. It is predatory, so the Burning Head uh, is a predatory endless spell. It can move up to 9 inches and can fly, which is cool. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, when the model set up, it can fire away. Flaming Skull. After the model has moved, each unit that has any models it passed across and each other unit that is within 1 inch of the end of its move suffers D3 mortal wounds. So it's a fast-moving D3 mortal wounds, and it's just a big missile going across, like literally a fiery missile um, going across the table there. It's got a wrathful, uh, wrathful aura. Uh, Reroll hit rolls of one for attacks made by units while they are wholly within nine inches of this model. Neat. So while the uh, the the grave tide does uh, protection against your guys. This one amplifies your shooting as it's moving. So kind of that moving and shooting, imagine some cavalry with that or, uh, you know, just some, uh, you know, uh, handgunners, archers, whatever. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's not a reroll misses type thing, but it's reroll ones. Uh, and that's, and for some of those models, I mean, it's, they're, they're all hitting on two pluses. So uh, pretty solid there. Uh, empowered by a, a, actually, uh, if your battle is taking place in the realm of fire, add one to the number of mortal rune, wounds inflicted by the flaming skull ability. So D3 plus one if you're in the realm of fire. Awesome. Decent model. Yeah, and it's uh, it's going to be a, a breeze to paint up. We'll do some cool washes and stuff and some kind of burnt cindery effects. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm digging that out. Absolutely. Okay. Um... Next up is going to be our uh, Emerald Life Swarm here. And I'll grab our model. Okay. So um, the Emerald Life Swarm here is, it's kind of an interesting model. I don't know if it's something that um, it is going to be uh, entirely, uh, not crazy fun to paint, but uh, there's a lot of detail in here. So I might go more kind of... Uh, Aura for most of it, kind of what they did in the books, and then add detail in, uh, fade that detail in as it kind of comes up to the top, which is which is neat. Um, definitely a, a one-piece model, and um, you know, kind of neat. Now, again, for purposes of painting, I didn't actually glue this in. I want to be able to, um, uh, you know, just kind of take it, prime it, paint it, uh, and then I'll put it on the base uh, a little bit later. It is pegged uh, at the bottom as all of the models are. Um, but I think for me, uh, I think I'm just going to cut that peg, build the base, uh, paint the model, and then you know, kind of super glue it on um, to, the, to the model itself, or to the, uh, to the base itself. So these uh, kind of big swarms of bugs going up and getting into everything. Again, very much a Sylvaneth kind of look and feel and patterned after the, the Sylvaneth uh, models and all that. But, uh, you know, big horde of stuff. I mean, this is something that in order to get like the Ripper Swarms, uh, we had to go to a Forge World model. Uh, we know we just had all these swarms kind of climbing all over each other. And I thought that was really cool. So having this big flood of bugs uh, heading out there, also, uh, also pretty darn neat.
yeah, neat model for sure. And I think it's going to be uh, a bit of detail work to paint uh, and a little bit of fiddling around, but I, I don't think it's going to be like a lot of work to, to get this guy done. So cool. Um, take a look at the, uh, the, the card now. We've got the endless, uh, Emerald Life Swarm here. Um, it is a uh, casting value of six. So you know, a lot of these are fairly easy to get out the door. Um, cast up the uh, Life Swarm model within 15 inches of the caster. Cool. It is predatory, so it does uh, go after dudes. Uh, it's got 10 inches, and of course, because it's right off, uh, right off the table. I'm oh, sorry, right off that it can fly. Now, there is nothing in here that we can see. The hop, the other ones can move. This one doesn't necessarily. So this is less of a missile for sure. Uh, after the model is set up, it has... Uh, uh, is set up after it has moved... After the model is set up, or after it has moved, pick unit, one unit within one inch of it. You can either heal D3 wounds, oh, traveling medic, uh, that have been allocated to that unit. If no wounds are currently allocated to the unit, you may return a number of slain models um, that have a combined wound characteristics equal to a less than roll of D3. So you can actually have a medic flying behind you, and it does it on its own, and you're not using one of your spells or chants or what have you. So uh, that is pretty darn sweet, actually. Um, and if your battle is taking place in the Realm of Life, roll a d6 to determine the number of wounds healed or wounds uh, worth of slain models to bring back. D6 wounds coming out the door. Um, uh, it seems a little weird, but I can, you know, I can totally see this in like a horde army uh, as this thing's traveling behind you, literally uh, collecting up your dead as you go. Very cool. Um, yeah, that's that's actually pretty awesome. So now we've got a cover mechanic, we've got a um, healing mechanic, and we've got a, a kind of an amplifier uh, mechanic for our um for our, our armies very neat so um emerald life swarm yeah decent and the rules are, are pretty sweet as well um man one of these traveling behind like a tree man or like uh or tree lord i guess now uh, or just any of the big monsters just kind of healing him up as he's barreling down the field uh that's really cool liking it and again anybody can take them i, I try and stick with the fluffy stuff but there there it is for sure all right, uh, moving along. Uh, let's do the uh, Ravenax Gnashing Jaws. Um, and uh, this is another big model in here. And it's, uh, like, it's big. You know, so if we do the, the, the skeleton of our, our rook here or whatever, I mean, that is a big model. Um, and really... This lots and lots of kind of power, these big, massive kind of spiritual jaws rolling across the table. Uh, I'm guessing, without looking at the card, that this guy's going to be a, a predatory, uh, a predatory spell. <laughs> it's just huge. Now, uh, the, just again to mention, uh, this isn't glued together. This is just kind of snap fit and then fit into the base. Uh, but I'm going to break it apart so I can paint it uh, a little bit easier. I think it's going to be very difficult to get in. Well, maybe not. But I, I just want to be able to get in here and paint it. But I think priming is going to be the big one. I'll, I'll, I'll decide that after I've primed it and see if I'm going to assemble it first. Um, so, yeah, this big, <laughs> this big massive set of jaws uh, range across the, the battlefield. Uh, as far as look and feel goes... Um, yeah, it's it's a big pile of jaws flying across the battlefield. It looks uh, it looks big and imposing. Uh, it's a little squared off for uh, for my tastes. I think it could be cooler if it wasn't so uh, you know kind of blocky. And you don't notice that till you kind of put it together. But it does have lots of detail. It does you know kind of go concave in here and um, you know kind of domes over the top and all that. So um, yeah, I still think it looks great. Uh, but that would be my only criticism so far, really. Uh, I do think it's going to be fair easy to paint uh and uh oh yeah just, just having this guy ra raging across the field would be uh would be pretty sweet to see for sure so uh, yeah really really digging that uh really digging the model uh, it was a little bit weird to put together there's some gaps that are in here and i trimmed everything pretty well and made sure it kind of lined up but i still ended up with some uh some gapage here just around the bottom of the jaws so that might be a liquid green stuff uh solution there uh to, to fix that all right, looking at the uh, the card, and there's a lot of stuff in this box. Like it is just an insane amount of stuff. 
that's going on with this uh, going on with this box. It's uh, it's it's a huge value. I'm loving it. Um, okay, the National Jaws has a casting value of eight. So like the the Sun, it's a little more uh, a little more difficult to cast um, within six inches of the caster. It's predatory, so it can move twelve inches and can fly. Crazy. Um, when the model is set up, the player set up can immediately make a move because it's got an endless appetite. Not uh, not all the other ones that are in there. It's got a ravening hunger. After this model is moved, each unit that has any models it passed across, and each other unit that is within one inch at the end of the spell suffers D3 mortal wounds. In addition, subtract one from the bravery characteristic um, of each unit that has any models passed across until the end of the battle round. So it's uh, it's got the uh, the grave tide bravery if it rolls over you, um, and it's got that anybody within an inch uh, or gets pounded by it is D three mortal wounds, which is cool. Um, it's empowered by Gur. Uh, if your battle is taking place in the realm of beasts, this model can move up to D six plus twelve inches instead of twelve. Holy, this guy can move. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be uh, in a straight line, which is also pretty crazy. So um, throwing this guy out on the field would be just a big pile, of, big pile of fun. I think that's <laughs> awesome. All right, so um, yeah, loving the model. Uh, Going to be lots of fun. Lots of animation uh, clearly going on. The big you know, <laughs> it's almost like flaming spiritual energies off the back. Uh, lots of animation. Uh, Going to be a ton of fun to put together uh, in terms of you know painting and getting them on the table and all that. So uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. Sweet. All right. Um, next up, we're going to be moving along the with the prismatic palisade, and I try and track down. I've got it. Oh, it's on the other side. It's on the other side of the sun on my desk. I couldn't see it. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, okay, so we've got the prismatic palisade. And uh, again, this is like a big crystal wall. Uh, or you can do it as a big ice wall, I guess. Whatever uh, whatever tends to make the most sense to you. Uh, and it's got this cool kind of little bit of animation that like when, the, when it was cast, it was just pulled out of the ground. And you can see the ground kind of crystallizing and cracking as the prism, uh, as kind of the prismatic palisade uh, comes up. Uh, not a whole lot of, uh, you know, believe it or not, there's not too many skulls, except for that one. And that one, <laughs> they're still managing to put skulls in because, you know, skulls are awesome. Um, so we got skulls and skulls and skulls for days. Uh, I, initially, I didn't see them right away, but so I was like, oh, maybe they didn't. No, they did, for sure. Skulls all over the place. Um, so we got the prismatic palisade here. And we can see that we've got all these uh, vertical uh, crystals coming up. And... Uh, yeah, it's not like a straight line either, which is kind of cool. It's this, you know, you can you can just kind of picture it like coming out of the ground as it uh, as it gets launched up from uh, as it's cast in. So pretty sweet, pretty sweet indeed. Now I'm assuming this is uh, a protective spell. Don't know why. It's very much like uh, magic. It feels a bit like that. Um, Prismatic Palisade has a casting value of five, so easy to pull off. Um, Wholly within 18 inches of the caster. So you can go and provide insta cover, um, or we'll see in a second, but you can go and you can put this wall up uh, anywhere, on the, anywhere on the table, pretty much, if you have your wizard uh, kind of rolling up the middle. At the start of each turn, roll a dice for each unit within 6 inches. So 18 inches away, plus 6 inches, you've got like a 24-inch uh, projection of power range on this, which is, which is kind of cool. On a five, subtract one from uh, from hit rolls for attacks made by that unit until the end of the turn. Hmm. So um, good for defense, uh, but also really good for knocking off horde attacks. So if you've got like a bunch of you know kind of punty uh, grot or uh, scavenny kind of cheap and dirty and just sheer numbers, you can really knock the shine off of those attacks in there. Neat. Um, a model cannot see another model if an imaginary uh, straight line, one millimeter wide, drawn from the center of the base to the center of the other model's base, uh, passes over this model. So it's absolute cover. It's infinitely tall, and you simply just cannot see through it. Um, you're holding an objective. You can't get shot at if you're behind the wall. If you are... Um, yeah, well, it doesn't move because uh, it's not predatory, so it won't move. But if you really want to lock down a spot, that's great. Um, but you can't shoot back over top. So you're just putting down a big, infinitely tall wall. Cool. And you're blinding other people that, that are within the six inches of it as well. 
If your battle is taking place in the realm of light, add one to rolls made to determine if a unit is affected by this model's blinding light ability. So quite bright. Um, very much a defensive spell. But I also like the fact that you cannot just up and gun line um, you know, through it where you can't get me and I can get you. So there is a, there is a balancing element to it. Um, or if someone's got a lot of assaults and you've got like, you know, hard guys, you can put this over an objective, say in the middle or in front of a castle or something like that. Something where your guys are very protected, uh, any kind of objective, and you can really lock that down. So big defensive, uh, bonuses, uh, for this guy here. Interesting. No, really, really interesting. And I'm liking the fact that they're pulling from all these different, um, uh, I'm liking the fact that they're uh, pulling from all these different uh, aspects here. I'll make sure you can see the cards. Sorry about the extra bright lights here. Um, I'm liking that they have all these different realms contributing uh, or in kind of informing their decisions on what uh, what models to make. So that's kind of that's kind of cool and it encourages you to play in different realms, which is neat. And then also just the fact that you've got some that are for defense that are some that are for offense you've got a rolling defense in the grave tide you've got like a hard line uh, defense with the palisades so that's uh that's pretty darn cool actually i'm liking that all right next up we're going to be looking at the uh, soul snare shackles and um these are all k in terms of uh the models themselves and um, I do like the fact that there's no repeating uh, poses, uh, no repeating kind of uh, pieces in here. But I do like the fact that the models themselves, they again look like they've kind of burst up from the ground. And they got this kind of Doc Octopus kind of going out and grabbing everybody kind of look and feel to them, which is, which is pretty darn sweet. So very neat. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're looking at constricting, so now we've got protection, we've got uh, things that, uh, you know, restrict shooting. And I'm guessing these guys are going to be our restricting of, uh, of movement. Now, um, again, uh, even though these are like little chains that are in there and they're fairly soft and malleable, they're not just going to break by virtue of dropping it. Um, they're not going to be all that self-destructive. So these chains, although, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of built here, uh, you don't really get a chance to see through the chain. So they're still fairly solid-ish uh, as they kind of go through. So um, awesome way to kind of set it up uh they're not all that brutal and oh man thank goodness they're not fine cast because this would be a disaster uh waiting to happen for sure um okay let's go on to the the rules themselves here so the uh, casting value of five so one of the easier ones to cast uh, definitely one of the, the the kind of smaller spells um uh you can set up within 12 inches of the caster then set up the second and third third shackles wholly within six inches of the first so you could daisy chain this 18 24 30 that last one you can fire this out and it can actually reach out 30 inches uh pretty pretty neat um bound for the great oubliette at the start of the movement phase roll a dice for each unit within six inches of any soul snare shackles uh and a soul share <laughs> soul snare shackles models tough to say on the three plus have the move characteristic of that unit until the end of that phase on a six that unit also suffers d3 mortal wounds holy so we can actually project these in a big um like in a fairly wide arc so 12 inches away and we can even set up a line 18 inches across that people are going to have to run the risk of getting through and it'll slow the movement now if you slow the movement it's going to be harder to get out of that area of effective six inches so really this could slow things down a load um, for an enemy uh, set of models um, and you could be doing mortal wounds possibly as well crazy um, it's not predatory so it will be stuck but again if you want to have a, a big line of uh, you know of um, of, of crazy demons kind of coming your way this might slow things down a little bit giving you some time to react so interesting um uh, i know with the fire slayers and the caradon caradron overlords uh, on the ground they're very slow so it could be used against them or it could be used in their uh, in their favor i imagine um but uh, interesting, interesting way to do it. Um, if your battle is taking place in the realm of death, the second and third soul snare shackles models can be placed wholly within nine inches of the first instead of six. So loads going on there. Um, interesting way to kind of break down 
uh, you know, a crazy enemy advance. So if you know it's coming or you're in some kind of tournament situation where you're not really sure what uh, people are going to be bringing for the day, <clears throat> this might reduce a little bit of the aha moments in terms of uh, getting people coming right at you anyway. Cool. So where the... Um, where the prismatic palisade, the, the barrier is, uh, it kind of prevents shooting through uh, and, and, and you, know, uh, you know, having people get around it. Um, this, in fact, uh, will kind of really slow people down. And it still throws out a little bit of damage as well. Uh, and very easy to cast, very easy to cast. So, um, yeah, just a nice set of models here. Uh, again, I mentioned before that, you know, set them up 90 degrees kind of perpendicular to the, uh, to the holes. And I think you'll be just, just fine. So it's uh, looking pretty good. All right, uh, moving on. Next up, we've got our Umbral Spell Portal. Okay, and I think our Umbral Spell Portals are, uh, those are our double ones, because you may find it. a model holy within 12 inches of the caster and then set up the second. Okay, so these are our portals here. Uh, here we go, okay. So basically, uh, you know, most most uh, of uh, fantasy and 40k always had some kind of uh, of gate um, that would go through, and you could kind of go in one way and come out the other. And um, this is a really nice kind of elegant way to to do this, where you can set up you know, kind of a shortcut. So where the shackles slow you down, the umbral spell portals will just advance you that much, uh, that much quicker. And there's been numbers of times in the game, obviously, where you're like, I wish these guys were like not over here, but over there. Uh, I could think of, you know, zombies, maybe a big horde of zombies or skeletons or what have you. Um, and it'd be nice to get that horde somewhere else, but they end up moving so slow. Uh, a spell portal could really make a, a big difference. Now, uh, for the models themselves, uh, nice sneaking in of the skulls, G-Dub, very nicely done. Uh, and they've got kind of that masked face that's up here as well. Um, and uh, it's got this kind of, you know, they're suspended by these, uh, you know, kind of Vorpal energies uh, coming off the back. What I thought was really cool is instead of having the effect on the double side, um, they just kind of made it more of the effect here. So it really kind of draws your eyes to the front. So if you came up with like a darkish, maybe purplish kind of effect and then went with like a gold uh, all the way through these kind of enchanted mirrors, I guess, where you'd be kind of going through. I think that would look pretty darn, pretty darn cool on the table and pretty darn sweet. So um, I really dig the models. They're, they're, it's it's kind of got its own um, little bit of simplicity going on. Let's grab some water here. Voice is dying. Okay. So um, the spell portals themselves, nice. And it's not a, a direct clone of the other, which is also nice. I think it'd be very easy just to make it. Oh, here's two of them, right? Um, so I'm really thinking that's, uh, that's pretty sweet. Now, part of me is wondering how this would work with multiples. So I'll, uh, I'll take a look at the, the card here now. So I'll move these over and let's, uh, let's take a look at the Umbral Spell Portal. So um, summon the Umbral Spell Portal as casting value 5. Uh, if successfully cast, set up the first Umbral Spell Portal within 12 of the caster and then set up the second Umbral Spell Portal model wholly within 18 inches of the first. Okay, so that's a lot. Um, especially if your caster's in the middle, you can draw guys from behind and up. Like that's a... That is a pretty big. Uh, that's a pretty big push. So you can get up to 18 inches of movement on, or uh, 18 inches of distance between the two. Not predatory. So once they're up, they're up. Uh, arcane passage. If a wizard successfully casts a spell while they're within one inch of the Umbral Spell Portal model, the range and visibility of the spell can be measured. Ah, oh, to the other Umbral Spell Portal uh, for from this endless spell. Oh no way! So you can shoot stuff out through it like a big spectral mirror. How cool is that? Uh, if a predatory endless spell finishes a move within six inches of the Umbral Spell por Portal, uh, remove it from the battlefield and set it up again anywhere within six inches of the other spell portal. So it's the huge passageway. So this isn't dudes. This is a magical spell, spell portal. I get it now. Okay. A little slow uh, 
Good job, Jay. Uh, a little slow getting up what a spell portal is, but it's a portal for spells. Well, so that doesn't affect the game balance at all. That's actually really, really cool. Um, and you can shoot stuff through because obviously one of the big things is that uh, people just hide from those wizards and they don't let the spells go through. But if you shoot a predatory spell through, oh man, imagine taking that big pendulum and using this to kind of refract or bend the distance or what have you. And you could like dispel it and then set it up again and then uh, set it up in front in that straight line for that uh, for that that uh, moving spell again. Ah, very cool. Um, uh, but empowered by Ulu, uh, if your battle is taking place next to the realm of Sha in the realm of shadow, the second umbral spell portal can be set up anywhere on the battlefield instead of eighteen inches uh, from the first. That is pretty awesome. And imagine having two wizards dueling each other through these portals uh, because everyone else is hiding from the wizards. That is awesome. That's really cool. I'm actually really digging that. I think that's a that's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool spell to have. And again, it's 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 not like anything else. It's totally filling its own uh, its own niche. So uh, yeah, that plus a predatory uh, predatory spell is going to be pretty uh, pretty cool. Loads going on with this thing. I actually I'm really liking those. They're uh, and I like things that are, they're not just a big lightning bolt that does damage. It's its nice to see things being totally affected in different ways uh, in the game. How cool is that? Yeah, really, really neat. Loving it. Okay. Uh, next up, we're going to be dealing with our chronomatic cogs. Grab this guy out here. Okay. And then our cogs are hiding. There it is. Okay. So now we've got our chronomatic cogs and let's uh, take a look at the model. So this to put together was a two part model and it was actually super simple to, uh, to just kind of set up. And I do love the fact that they're very well detailed. They've got all these little gears and cogs. You can see they're being manifested out of the spectral energies here. So it's literally coming up out of the ground and it's not just cogs flying through the air. There's these spectral cogs. Uh, skulls for the sake of skulls, sweet, but every little cog is trimmed uh, differently. So if we go in with that uh, kind of burnished gold on these cogs, it'll be it'll be nice to see that everything is going to be just a little bit different in terms of the cogs. So they're all unique, and you can see even here, uh, it's you know these are coming out of the spectral energies, and it looks like it's either eroding away or kind of a constant state of flux, whether it's in or out of uh, the space that you're in. Uh, more skulls, clearly more skulls are good, um, but just a nice way to set it up. Now I did not glue these together; they're just glued together. They're just stuck together by the two pins that are in the middle. But because um, I want to really get in and paint that detail, it'll be easy to paint for sure, and then we just stick it back together a bit of glue, and we're done. So yeah, really nice. Um, really cool little model and it looks like traveling cogs through the air so uh, really really sweet all right looking at the card uh, we've got a casting value of seven so a little more uh, kind of higher rent than the easy ones uh, set up a chronomatic cog wholly within 12 inches of the caster um, and it doesn't have the quick move thing there uh, it's not predatory so it is going to stay the mechanisms of time in their controlling player's hero phase, a single war wizard within nine inches of this model may manipulate the cogs to increase or decrease the flow of time. They may do this in the same phase as the chronomatic cogs are set up. If they do so, choose one of the effects opposite. The effect lasts until the next hero phase or until an enemy wizard chooses to manipulate the cogs. Speed up time. Add two inches to the move characteristic of all units on the battlefield. In addition, add two to charge rolls for all units on the battlefield. So you go up and spin the wheels and you can speed up your guys. Oh man, for assaults or just trying to move guys around the field, huge. Or you can slow down time. The wizard manipulating the cogs can set cast one additional spell in this hero phase. In addition, re-roll failed save rolls for that wizard. So you can turn this into kind of a wizard amplification thing. Uh, you can cast one additional spell through your uh, spell portals would be kind of neat. Um, and if the wizard is within nine inches, so not too bad, um, especially when the, uh, yeah, you can put it within nine inches of the wizard. 
Uh, da -da 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 -da. So you don't have to be too close, um, but you can still kind of reach out and manipulate the cogs. So just kind of an interesting way to affect the game. And again, this one would be much more tailored towards uh, whichever army that you ended up uh, ended up taking at the time. Um, you know, definitely you want to kind of play this for your benefit, which is, uh, which is pretty solid. Nice. Love it. Very cool. Okay, so again, the model... Um, just lots of flavor, lots of flair. Um, nice to see that it's just simple, but you know it's got a complex look to it, um, but still very easy to assemble. And it'll be fun to paint it. It'll be easy to paint uh, this one here. And uh, the size of it, again, I, keep, you know, I haven't done the size comparisons for a minute or two here, but it's still a good size model. Even the portal looks like you can fit like a whole model through it. So um, just really nice to see this decent kind of piece rolling across the the table here. So very nice, very nice. All right. Uh, pulling the cogs aside, the Gemnids of Ulgish. Okay. And these ones are decent. I think I missed one. Uh, I'm just running out of stuff to look at here. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, the Maelstrom. I've got the Maelstrom. Um, sorry, just getting organized here as we go. Um, um, we're going to look at, so the Geminids of Ulgish are these little dudes here. And again, these are the yin yang, uh, pieces. So, I mean, I'm, I would always be tempted to maybe set them up like this. Um, the one piece kind of going together, um, not crazy inspired, uh, you know, uh, balls with energy, um, the, maybe kind of paint them up a bit like a ball lightning with kind of different shades, uh, the black and white and the yin yangs. Uh, so maybe I'll do a white ball with kind of white flames and a black ball with kind of black flames. Um, and, uh, all the, uh, inappropriate ball jokes, uh, will you write themselves. It's, uh, going to be great. Maybe one should be blue and one should be white. I, I don't know. We'll figure it out. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be incredible. Um, so not the craziest of inspired ones in here, um, but again, we can really play off that whole yin yang uh, intended kind of um, kind of kind of piece to it here. Uh, so uh, I mean, they're pretty straight up, pretty straightforward. Uh, but again, they're not duplicates of each other, and I really think that would be uh, very easy for them to do. Uh, but they haven't gone that route, which is which is fine by me. Um, assembly was great. Um, they had a couple seam lines, but the seam lines were really uh, blended into these curves of the kind of lines of force over top. So I don't think that uh, I don't think that it was a problem at all. Those were very easy to assemble. All right, Geminids of Ulgish. Uh, so the Geminids of Ulgish here, um, uh, the, you summon them up. Uh, casting value of seven. Set up both models within six inches of each other, and both wholly within 18 inches of the caster. So they uh, they orbit uh, and stay close to each other, which makes total sense. You must then nominate one model to be the light, and the other to be the shadow. So again, that painting is uh, going to be fairly important uh, in terms of getting that out. They are predatory, so they do move around. Uh, they're an endless spell. Uh, they can move... Uh, up to eight inches and can fly. When you move this endless spell, the second model must finish its move within six inches of the first. Uh, if this is impossible, the spell is dispelled. So um, being careful how you set that up. Unleashed. When the model is set up, player set it up, can immediately move it. Fine. Uh, tendrils of shadow and light. After the shadow uh, geminid model is moved, each unit that has any models it passed across suffers D3 mortal wounds. Oh, doing wicked damage. In addition, subtract one uh, from the attacks characteristics of melee weapons used by each unit that has models it passed across until the end of the battle round. So this can really, uh, it's a darker, obviously the darker side of the pair, and it, uh, it'll give you grief. Um, the lighter side, after the light geminid model has moved, uh, each unit that has any models it passed across suffers D3 mortal wounds, so still offensive. In addition, subtract one from the hit rolls for each unit that has any models it passed across until the end of the battle round. So, attacks characteristic, uh, one from hit rolls. Okay, fair. Empowered by Hish. Uh, if your battle is taking place in the realm of light, you can re-roll the dice to determine the number of mortal wounds suffered by a unit. So that's D3 re-rollable. That's, uh, that's decent. Uh, passed by the light geminid. Um, empowered by Ulgu. If your battle is taking place in the realm of shadow, you can re-roll the dice to determine the number of mortal wounds suffered by the unit. So if it's light or shadow, uh, you can take uh, uh, one of the, one of the, uh, the geminids 
and um, you know do some extra damage with it. So a little bit more bookkeeping, I think, with this. Not bookkeeping, but just a little bit more kind of extra knowledge uh, going on in here. But I do like the fact of kind of the light and the dark having different effects. Um, maybe it would be good to make up some tokens that go with this or, uh, you, know, you know, a little piece of paper or something like that. Just because if these two are within, uh, you know, a couple inches of each other, there could be multiple effects going over top. And if you ram both of these over a horde unit, um, attacks would go down, uh, difficulty to hit would go down, uh, or sorry, a difficulty to hit would uh, would go up, and you know they could really affect kind of those those ranging units as we as we go. So again, a model's not crazy inspired, and we're going to definitely see that with the uh, with the maelstrom as well. But in terms of that kind of yin yang kind of fluff element to it. I think there's something cool we could do with that uh, from a from a painting perspective for sure. So uh, yeah, not uh, not too bad. Um, and uh, you know, like I said, that not the crazy most inspired uh, piece in here, but the yin and yang with kind of the, the kind of orbiting each other, ah, that'd be kind of cool. I need to see uh, see ultimately anyway. All right, so we're down to our final model in the uh, in the set here, and that's going to be our malevolent maelstrom, uh, which is probably my least favorite, uh, kind of most uninspired uh, model here. Um, again, they've kind of done the the the, the flaming ball of stuff um, going on in here, and the malevolent maelstrom. It's I think there's a couple things I'm not a huge fan of. Let's grab some more water here. Um, there's a couple things I'm not a big fan of. I think that. Uh, I think that the, the they could have gone a little bit differently with it. Um, I, the tilt of it is kind of a little odd in the fact that you cannot see uh, kind of what's what's going on, or maybe it's leaning in to uh, to grab your dude. Um, it's uh, it's still a good sized model. Uh, seeing our, our our rook in here, um, it's still a fairly decently sized model. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't know. I think it's a uh, I just don't think they could have been a little bit more, uh, and uh, and there it is. So, um, what my plan is for this is I know they had like a bunch of skeletons, uh, kind of skulls and stuff piercing the veil of this maelstrom, and I think we could really kind of, really kind of go to town with that. Maybe have it be this inky, kind of bluey, purpley uh, energy. And then do the skulls up in like the bone color and all like this, the, the skulls that are kind of peering through and then just wash them back with the same color we use for this kind of inky murky mess, almost like they're pushing the skin, uh, pushing the skin forward of this maelstrom trying to escape, but just, just can't. So I think we could do something very cool with this, even though Maybe I'm not the biggest fan of the, the model itself, but I think through painting we could do something really cool and different and interesting for sure. Um, it does have a little bit of animation, this kind of circular, uh, it's like it's spinning in kind of a circular motion, you know, throwing out uh, force to kind of propel itself along the along the ground through the kind of the, the mortal realms here. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's not, it could be uh, pretty decent. So, um you know, it's most, but it's definitely something I have to work at. It's not an easy, um, it's not an easy transition into what you think would be cool. Um, like the gnashing jaws, for example. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Big jaws flying through the air. So uh, maybe we can just be a little bit more subtle with this. So fair enough, fair enough. Um, going over here now to the uh, rule itself here, or the rules, the card. Um, the malevolent maelstrom is. Um, I mean, it's it's. It's, uh, like I said, it's, it's I don't know, maybe the concept just isn't uh, grabbing me entirely 100%. Um, to summon it, it's a casting value of 7, set up uh, anywhere wholly within 18 inches of the caster, so it's decent. Um, it's predatory, so it can move up to 8 inches and can fly, so we can see now that pretty much everything that moves can fly, which is neat. A devourer of sorcery and souls. If a wizard successfully casts a spell within 12 inches of the Melvin Maelstrom and the spell is not unbound, the Maelstrom will attempt to steal the energies of the spell. Oh, make an additional unbinding roll for that spell. If this unbinding roll is successful, the spell is unbound and one energy point is, al a point is allocated to the model. Uh, in addition, one energy point is allocated to this model for each unit destroyed within six inches of the model. So it literally is a black hole that is sucking in the energies of uh, wizardry and um, as units are destroyed, it's pulling in their souls. 
eat that stormcast um morbid detonation at the end of each battle round roll the dice for each malevolent maelstrom and add the number of energy points allocated to that model uh the model to the roll on a seven plus that maelstrom explodes each unit within 3d6 so up to 18 inches of the model that exploded suffers d3 mortal wounds the model that exploded is then dispelled yikes it's a bomb it's a big energy bomb that's kind of cool if your battle is taking place in the realm of death, allocate one additional energy point to this model at the start of the battle, battle round. So I've got a death army, and I think what's going to end up happening is I'm going to end up using this model um, in our uh, in in the death games, the soul sucking black hole. Fine, I'm going to make it work. I've got uh, I've got no choice now. I've got to make the uh, the black hole of of, of energy. I got to make this a thing. So maybe like a blue-black energy or, you know, kind of surrounding the maelstrom itself. Maybe just a one kind of tone up and do blue-black and then the skeletons coming through or the uh, skulls coming through. Yeah, maybe we'll make this thing a thing. Uh, and it's just such a, it's, it's such a don't give a crap model. Like just, it's just going to be a total game changer. Uh, if you've got, you know, super anal retentive friends that really have to win the game, <laughs> bring it in and just watch as they, uh, as they blow, as you kind of sacrifice your queen for their queen kind of thing. Um, yeah, it could be could be neat. Uh, the the game mechanics I think are just kind of new and different and interesting, and it's just this big floating bomb, and uh, you get to be the crazy man who's like running around on the bomb zone as your conservative friends are just trying to run away from it. So, could be uh, could be pretty cool actually. I uh, I don't mind that. I'll, so I'll I'll give it a good try. I'll uh, you know I'll just uh, I'll I'll paint it up the way that I want to paint it, and I I know the affection might grow. Um, the affection might grow. It looks really good. So I think um, that kind of concludes the review, but I think before we go, we should just get a big collection of all of our plastic on the, uh, on the table here. So um, here's, our, here's our friend for scale, uh, you know, just for the kind of the one inch sized base. Um, and just trying to fit all of these inside the camera uh, arc is going to be a little bit uh, difficult. So for the price in the dollars and cents, um, that you pay uh, or, or or pounds or whatever for the price that you pay um, there is just an immense amount of plastic here uh, just an immense amount of, of plastic here and I'm still adding them on and still adding them on grave tide big flaming skull um, let's see if I can fill up the entire range of the camera with models from this kit big one in here so again the 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 value proposition of how much you get uh and it weighs a ton like when you're doing the when you're collecting it all together it absolutely weighs a ton um just because of all the plastic that's in there so for the price you pay i mean you get a a ridiculous amount of plastic and tons of stuff to paint and it's all different i mean i think the the thing that gives us a lot of fatigue is having something different and this would be great like you got one week um you want to kind of build something and 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 you know uh you know before your next game or something like that uh, you could build one of these spells and you add just a massive cool interesting dynamic to the game and really it's not it's not costing you any kind of you know um uh, you know, not building like an army of these things. You can just pick one of these. You really like it. You paint it up. It's out the door and you're just adding stuff to your army, kind of increasing the capability and just adding a lot of narrative to your games. Uh, you can even as from a narrative perspective, you can just have, if you've got a set and your buddy's got a set, you can go through like the Axe Lands and play, <laughs> you play Mario Brothers or Frogger or whatever it is, as these guys are traveling left and right across the battlefield. So you can have some ludicrous fun with this. Anyways, massive amount of plastic. Uh, really cool to see how it, uh, you know, see it all laid out on the table finally, which is great. Um, the rules are neat. The endless spells are cool. And um, yeah, I'm super impressed with the kit in general. It's it, like, it is a massive thumbs up. Even if I'm not overjoyed at some of the stuff like the maelstrom and the uh and, and and you know the yin yang balls here and all that even if i'm not super duper impressed by all of it um 
wow, what a what an immense value and uh, just really cool to kind of add it in. And you know what? We'll make these work. We'll make them look really good while we're painting them anyway. So um, that's it for this review, guys. I just want to say a uh, quick thanks for watching, obviously. And um, if you've got uh, any comments, throw them down in the comments below. Got any questions about the kit, let me know. And um, we'll be doing some streaming as we go forward, uh, painting all of these up. And some of them will be super quick. We're going to do the pendulum, I think, first. Um, and we'll stream that and see how that goes. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So uh, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, if you liked the video, jab that like button, please. Um, like just jab the crap out of every video that you can. If you, if you like it, hit that like button um, for me or any of the other YouTubers that are out there. Uh, it definitely helps get the video out there. Um, it really helps with the YouTube algorithms, and it's great. Uh, if you want more videos just like this, jab that subscribe button, and uh, uh, you know, trying to put out content. You know, uh, you know, one, one or two pieces a week is kind of the the goal there. Um, and then maybe we'll do more with streaming as the the channel kind of picks up speed a little bit here. Um, you know, you've got to still work for a living, uh, but obviously, if we can get some dollars and cents rolling in from the YouTube stuff, then I can do more and more and more. It's a, I'll be able to justify taking time off, uh, you know, daily work to make this happen. So um, uh, subscribe if you're interested, and there's a little kind of bell that's right beside it. If you jab that, you'll get notifications on all your devices. Uh, about any of our upcoming streams or content or anything like that. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. Hope it was of immense value, and we'll catch you in the next video.